So Jerry's explorations has led him to develop a rare array of perspectives and skills keen for solving challenges and helping those around him find what fulfills them. As a speaker and facilitator, Jerry excels in captivating audiences and meeting them where they are. Through levity logic, radiant storytelling, he repositions even the densest of subjects to serve listeners of all walks of life. Without further ado, I present Jerry Thompson III. <laughs> thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you to all of you in the room right here. That was a fantastic intro. I feel like the bar has been set high, especially to kick off an event such as this. Uh, exciting week and super grateful to be here. So on behalf of myself, uh, Max, who's helping support me um, at, with all the tech stuff and our company, Optimism Online, so excited to be here. Um, we have a more intimate group today, and I love that. So we have Q&A already planned after talking, but there are going to be a couple points where I'm going to be looking for maybe a couple hands to be raised, a couple nods of approval or disagreement. I really enjoy making these sorts of engagements, conversations, if that's okay, especially since it looks like we do have enough room for people to, to be heard. Um, some of this stuff doesn't need to be given in lecture form. Uh, I don't like to talk at people. I really like to be in discussion. So um, anything I can help clear out, if you want to take a note or hold your question till the end, like I'm here for all of it. Let's have a real discussion about this sort of stuff. So real quick to start us off, how many of you are familiar with Simon Sinek and some of his work? Start with why leaders eat last. Give me a show of hands. I'm seeing like 25%, 30%. Okay. Okay. Anybody familiar with The Infinite Game? Has that been in a, in a book club or reading list for anybody? Okay, one hand. I, I like the enthusiasm. Thank you so much. So what we're going to talk about today, um, I think, has a lot to do with this, this sales kickoff week that you have. So it's exciting that you're all here in person. I'm sure you're excited to see each other. Um, and today we're going we're gonna to dive into some kind of dense topics in a very casual and approachable way. So Simon's most recent work, The Infinite Game, another New York Times uh, bestseller, fantastic book, is an exploration about adopting mentalities that allows us to take all of our energy, all of our, uh, our talents, all of our skill sets, and play them out in a way so that we can maintain position in the games that we're in. So we're going to talk a little bit about game theory. Uh, we're going to do some storytelling, but, but first, let me tell you how he kind of got to this idea. In 1986, a little bit of a, a history lesson here, there was a book called Finite and Infinite Games by a theologian named Dr. James Carse. Now, the book is about game theory, how people and, and we make decisions in certain scenarios. And this is a theologian, a holy man, if you will, who took it upon himself to write a very dense book about the entire subject. And one of Simon's inherent gifts is taking complicated ideas and distilling them in such a way that they are approachable. And I would never recommend as, you know, forced homework to read Finite and Infinite Games, but it's one of those books that you make it to page five and you're like, wow, public school and my college degree has failed me because it is very, very dense. <laughs> but what turned this theologian, this, this man of the cloth, onto this idea of game theory was actually his children. Dr. James Carr's had three children, and Simon actually got a chance to speak with him in the last few years of his life. And he was explaining to Simon that, you know, he had raised his kids, he tried to teach them values, tried to teach them how to be upstanding citizens and, and developing people in the world, but he noticed some distinct differences in how they would behave. His kids, that he knew them to be kind, gentle, compassionate, caring, serving, in certain scenarios, they would kind of completely flip the script and act completely outside of their behavior that he would expect. And he noticed this would be specifically in scenarios where they were playing games. And I say the word game to describe how most of us would think of games. Think of sports, think of chess, think of uh, Monopoly. I don't know if you got to spend, hopefully you did some quality time around family around the holidays. If board games are even allowed in your house, it's usually because uh, people somewhat know how to act around games. But in my house, we can't play games because no one knows how to act. Uh, people are upset. Uh, there's sometimes accusations of cheating. Things get aggressive. Things get loud. And Dr. James Carson noticed the same thing in his children, that even when somebody won, 
they weren't satisfied, they'd still be upset. Oh, I could have done better. I could have beaten them more. But yet in other contexts, these exact same children, his sweet darling children, were nothing but amicable and cooperative, caring and sharing. And these would be maybe games that we don't normally think about. So maybe it was preparing an evening meal and activity or something like art or putting together a puzzle, something where we lost some of these qualities that we think of in traditional games. And he said, okay, there must be something going on here. Why are the same children acting so differently in these different scenarios? And he developed this whole idea of finite and infinite games. Simon picked up the content and did what Simon does and said, how can I apply this to leadership and business and help give people the best chance to express their full self, to, to follow their inspiration and serve the way that people in businesses certainly can do. And so he took it upon himself and created this book, uh, The Infinite Game. And, and that's the text that we're going to be talking about today. And it's really interesting because as we go through this, hopefully you'll see how we are all involved in finite and infinite games. So let's, let's get straight into it, y'all. So let's talk about finite and infinite games. There are basically two categories of games that we are all playing at any given time. And again, playing is a metaphor. You don't need a sports jersey. You don't need special soccer cleats. We are involved in different sorts of games. So finite games are those games that we think of when someone says, hey, let's play a game. And there are some key characteristics that are important to keep in mind here. A finite game has known players. So I know the Super Bowl is coming up and I'm from the East Coast. I'm in Jersey right now. So the Eagles, my, my hometown team, might have a chance there. So there are known players in a traditional U.S. football game. It would be very, very weird if after the third quarter, when the Eagles go into their, their team locker room, that an entirely different team came out and finished the game. That's not how games work. The number of players that, and the same players that you start the game with are the same players you need to end the game with. That's basically in our general understanding of games. Another quality of finite games is that we have to play by fixed rules. And in fact, that is so important that we have entire careers dedicated to that. These are umpires, referees. Uh, these are rule books if you're into board games or things of that sort. We have clearly defined rules and then we might even have penalties if you break those rules. In fact, you might be banned from competitive play for life, depending on how you violate these rules. So we have known players. Everybody knows what the rules are, and we agree to these rules. We might disagree if you want to challenge a play, but even that is included in the rules. So another win for finite games, the way we traditionally think about games. Thirdly, finite games have a finish line. And in fact, they have a clear beginning, middle, and end. We know when the game ends, and that also helps us determine this last and final part, winners and losers. So again, let's take U.S. football, since it's a little bit topical for me right now. We know that the team with the greatest number of points at the end of the fourth quarter or overtime or sudden death, if it goes to that, is the winner of the game. Pretty familiar for everybody, yes? Everybody kind of understands how games work? Okay, well, that's great for finite games, but let's talk about some things where we might apply a finite mentality and it's actually an infinite game. So let's talk a little bit about infinite games for a second. So in an infinite game, unlike a finite game, we have known and unknown players. And I will posit, I will offer to you that some of the bigger games in our world are infinite games. These are things like relationships. These are things like marriage. These are things like business, health. These are infinite games, and you'll kind of see by the time I get to the end of this how they qualify as infinite games. Known and unknown players, that is a quality of an infinite game. Let's take the business world, for example. There is no rule necessarily saying that there is a limited number of uh, staffing firms that can be in one certain area. Somebody can suddenly open up shop, kind of like how y'all came out of almost nowhere to tremendous success just uh, about a year ago or two. And no one has to announce themselves that they are entering the game or leaving the game. Companies go in and out of business and there's no control over that. Unlike something like a sports game where we need to know who's on the field at all times. Secondly, in an infinite game, we have no fixed rules. And outside of how to operate legally within your country, there really are no rules when it comes to something like business. There's no clear guideline on how you have to do your marketing, how you have to go through your sales process, how you even have to do your business accounting necessarily, or how you have to manage your, your HR function. 
everyone has an opportunity and an option to play however they want. Thirdly, there's no end to this game. And I love bringing up the game of life as an infinite game. While our lifetimes might be limited, humanity, society, that's an infinite game where we're doing our best to continue maintaining humanity and society. That's why there's such a huge uh, urgency around our climate right now, because we see that as something limiting our ability to continue playing the game of life as a species on this planet. And so ultimately what it boils down to is unlike in our maybe more competitive finite mindedness where we're looking for winners or losers, in an infinite game, we really only have ourselves to use as comparison and we can only be ahead and behind. And our objective is to have more head days than behind days. It's more of a process of continuous improvement because the purpose of an infinite game is simply to stay in the game. It's not to beat the competition. It is not to, to win at all costs. It is simply to have the opportunity to continue being in the game. So, Brandon, I really appreciate your greeting. As you said, hey, it's, it's a great day to, to be here, great here to be alive. I see life as an infinite game. The opportunity to play it every single day is something that I'm grateful for. But here's the challenge. All too often in our, our climate, our culture, and, and the way that these ideas are spoken about, we approach infinite games with a finite mindset. And when that happens, there are a couple of key things that are sure to happen at some point. When you approach an infinite game with a finite mindset, you are sure to experience a loss of trust, a loss of innovation, and a lack of cooperation. Case in point, and Simon uses this quote brilliantly. He says, if you feel like you are winning in your marriage, my friend, you are definitely losing. <laughs> you seeing some of the idea here? Marriage is not something you can win. Uh, business is something you can progress in, but it's not something you can necessarily win. So most of all today, I want to offer uh, a different way of looking, a, a broader way of looking at the, at the world of business, how we interact with our teams, how we interact with ourselves through this infinite minded lens so that you can take all of your energy, your talent, your resources, your skills, your knowledge, your connections, and not only just implement them for a tremendous 2023, but implement them as long as you want to continue playing the game. All we need to do is apply some of these simple adjustments to our mindset. And Simon did a great job breaking out five key pillars, five key practices we're going to break down so that we can actually adopt and apply this infinite mindset. But for the sake of keeping things conversational, this is kind of a, a huge point. I hope you can see the difference between finite and infinite games. And I just want to open up the space. I hear the microphone works um, to see if there's any questions, something I can clarify before moving forward. I'm okay with silence. I'm not, and we can just talk. <laughs> any questions, any, any, hey, that doesn't sound right. Or, hey, what about Parcheesi? Is that an infinite game? <laughs> No? Okay. Has anyone thought of these concepts of finite and infinite games before? You might be a, you know, a game theorist in the making. I'm not sure. No? Okay. So relatively new information? Okay. Well, as I go through this, I think I'll probably have another place. If I can add any more context or examples, I certainly will. Uh, but definitely just sharing stuff that is, uh, you know, not connecting. Let's make all those connections today, either throughout this or in the Q&A after. So let's get into it. Let's talk about these five practices on how we can lead with an infinite mindset. And I think the, the great opportunity here is these practices are, are kind of all in the space between your ears. They're in how you interact. They are how you view uh, the activities and intentionality that you move with. So we're not saying, hey, you need to buy a whole new tech system or you need to invest in all of this training. No, these are just simply different ways of understanding the game that you're truly in and approaching it with the appropriate mindset. Because given our wildly, we'll say accelerating world, I don't think that many companies realize that they're not in a position to lose cooperation, lose uh, the ability for innovation or lose trust within their teams just because our business environments are that competitive. They are that global. And again, infinite game, nobody needs to announce themselves. Some of our greatest company unicorns that have come up really blindsided entire industries. And it's simply because they were in an infinite game. Uber did a fantastic job. You know, they say they are a personal logistics company, but they put some heavy pressure on the taxi industry. <laughs> 
you know, and they didn't necessarily need permission to do so. So in this climate that we have, where we've seen things like a global pandemic in our lifetimes, uh, maybe a once in a several generation event, I think it's all in our awareness that, wait a second, the world is moving quickly. Things can change at any time. So um, it is super timely to be sharing this message. And, and I hope it's received well about how we can expand our thinking so that we can still continue to play the game. Because it's great to do fantastic things in our careers or, or in our businesses, but wouldn't we like the, the service that we offer our clients, our customers, our communities to last, to leave some idea of a legacy, not just be a blip on the timeline of the, the history, the arc that is business? And I believe you all are set up very well to do this. So let's talk about these five principles. I'm just going to get them all right up here. So there are five practices right here. One of my colleagues, Shed, puts this very, very well. Often, especially around this time of the year where we're trying to get in a different mindset, maybe making goals, maybe making New Year's resolutions, so often we like to be prescriptive about how we approach things. And people often see the slide and they say, okay, but what order do I need to move in? And my colleague Shed brilliantly says, this is kind of like health. So let me run this by you. I'm not a doctor, that is very clear. So do not, do not come to me for health advice. But there are a couple components, several components you might need for, you know, a healthier life. It might include getting adequate amounts of rest, drinking water, eating nutrients and maybe vegetables if you want, seeing your doctor, flossing your teeth. It's all of these elements combined that build a body of health and maintain a body of health. If you were to leave out some of those elements, you might struggle because you might be leaving out some of the important elements just for you. And there's no point in time where you say, okay, I flossed my teeth a hundred days in a row. Are my teeth healthy yet? It's this continual process. Um, so the way we have everything laid out right here makes perfect sense, but you can start at any point in this circle. We like to start at the top with a just cause. So one of the first five principles we're gonna be talking about is advancing a just cause. And that is a clear and defined vision of the future. Secondly, in order to approach things with an infinite mindset, we need to build trusting teams. So our just cause is kind of like our bold vision, our North Star out there in the world. And if you're familiar with some of Simon's work, start with why. Simon knows a lot about purpose and leadership. So uh, we say it's not a Simon presentation unless there's a circle involved. So you're seeing some echoes of this. But we need to build trusting teams. We have our big, bold, just cause out there. Our North Star, we want to drive towards but the thing is, if we could do it alone, it would already be done. We're going to need a diversity of skill sets, experiences, knowledge, um, and just sometimes people to do work in order to advance our just cause, in order to pursue this clearly defined vision of the future. We're going to need teams. And what is a team without trust? It's just a bunch of people. <laughs> so we need some cohesion with our trusting teams. Thirdly, we need to study our worthy rivals. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference between a worthy rival and the classic finite-minded idea of competition. Fourth, and penultimate, we need to prepare for existential flexibility, which is something that we've all probably experienced, whether we were able to name it that or not, over the past couple of years with changes due to the global pandemic, COVID. And then last but not least, uh, demonstrate the courage to lead. Now, all of these elements involved some level of courage, uh, but it's really good that this is pointed out as its own practice, because it's the idea of stepping towards an unknown possibility for the hope that we can accomplish our just cause. It's stepping into the unknown, not being sure what's going to come out of it, but knowing, being certain that we are driving towards our North Star. So this is how we're going to jump into things every uh, today. And I'm guessing everybody can hear me well. Is that correct? Yes? Yes? Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about our just cause right here. Advancing a just cause. I mentioned it is a specific yet unrealized vision of our future state. And I'm actually going to just show you a few examples. A just cause is is magnetizing, it's galvanizing, and you have elements of your just cause. For a lot of companies, they look like vision statements or mission statements. And I have a few of them up on screen right here. Uh, given his recent birthday, MLK is super appropriate up here. Martin Luther King Jr., a, a political a social leader, had a just cause. It was about having kids of different skin tones and different ethnicities being able to spend time together and share time and not be uh, subject to violence. Very important thing, something that we are still working to live out. 
Simon, uh, our founder, our whole just cause for our company, we say uh, safe, uh, inspired and fulfilled. We hope everybody wakes up feeling inspired, feels safe wherever they are and is fulfilled at the end of the day by the work that they do. Sweet Green, a company you might all have heard for, heard of, their just cause is to inspire healthier communities by connecting people to real food. These are all examples of just causes. And while they are different in their wording and phrasing, they all have some elements in common that truly make them effective, truly make them something that encourages people to find their part in it so they can support the mission. And here they are right here, there's five of them. Just cause needs to be for something, inclusive, service oriented, resilient and idealistic. So I'll break these down very quickly. So a just cause being for something is, is very, very important. Uh, all too often, we have a habit of just talking about what we don't want. We can often be very clear on what's not gonna work for us, the situations that we want to avoid, the type of world that we want to prevent, but it's on us as, as leaders, as individuals to spend some time getting clarity on what we actually want to move towards. Because while you can get a lot of energy and excitement about saying, no, no, we don't want that. Well, after you've kind of gotten through that initial rush of activity or emotion, okay, well, where are we actually going towards? Organizations, people, teams need something to pull them towards that North Star. And that's why it's important that your just cause is a clear and specific vision of the future. Second point here on our just cause is that it needs to be inclusive and it's optimal when it's inclusive. A just cause when it's very well stated is something that anybody can see themselves in, whether they're actually a part of your organization, your team or not. Again, one of my colleagues, uh, Shed again, I'll use him as an example. He has two uh, products created by Patagonia that he's never bought. They all come through their refurbishment product, but because Shed cares about the environment, he can see himself in that just cause and he speaks about Patagonia as though he's sponsored on almost every keynote. It's incredible. They, they kind of owe him a check at this point. But that's because that just cause was so magnetizing to him. He saw himself in it and he proudly wears his gear. I know when Shed is wearing his Patagonia stuff. But if you can phrase your just cause, your vision of the clear future so that others can find any small way to contribute to it, it's extremely powerful. It's something that kind of hinges on the idea of a movement rather than just a mission a mission being a more specific and maybe time-bound uh, goal or objective. Thirdly, our just cause needs to be service-oriented to be optimal. Because at the end of the day, our businesses are so much more than just an opportunity to bring in money or capital or profit. Our businesses have the opportunity to serve others, your clients, your customers, your communities. That's massive. And sometimes, People literally create companies just for the sale. And that's, that's one world in and of itself. But for most organizations and teams, there is more at stake than just the pursuit of profit. And I'm here to suggest, if you haven't considered it, that that applies to you too. We talk a little bit about this when we talk about personal purpose, but you know, even as individuals, we are naturally service oriented. We are at our natural best when we are around others, when we are in teams, when we are in communities. So why wouldn't that carry over to our just cause as well? Fourth quality that makes a, a great optimal just cause is something that's resilient, something that can stand the changes, the, the evolutions, the iterations of society and time. And it's, it's really interesting. Let's say in the early 20th century, you created a company whose just cause was to advance the capability of the landline telephone. Well, fast forward about 100 years and people, kids literally have no idea what a landline telephone is. <laughs> that's a just cause that isn't completely well thought out. That's something that's not quite resilient versus someone that is, has, starts a company or organization whose just cause is to advance communication for consumer use. Well, now we open up so many more options. We could be using a landline telephone. We could be using uh, teleconferencing like we are right now. Cell phones get included into there. So the idea there is to, to sometimes we need to broaden our just cause so that it's resilient and not just focused on the technology or opportunity of the moment, but something that, again, is going to be longstanding and feed into that legacy. And then last but not least, our just cause needs to be idealistic. Now, my actual job title has the word optimist in it. I'm guessing nobody else here has something like that in their job title. No, no one else here is an optimist. Okay. 
So I'm an exception there, but often we get called optimist. It comes with the territory, uh, but idealistic. And I don't mean that to be unreasonable. I'm not saying all of our just causes need to be moonshots, but our just cause needs to be so big, so bold, and so daring that it calls people towards it. It needs to be something that is so audacious. Think back to Martin Luther King Jr.'s just cause, or even our just cause of, you know, inspired, safe, and fulfilled. We know that we might not realize that in our lifetimes, but it's so magnetizing, it's worth pursuing day after day. Because that's another thing our just cause can do, is it gives us some of that resilience, that strength, when we don't feel like doing the work, which inevitably will happen. We are not machines, fun fact. So five things on the just cause right there. And again, if you have questions, let's talk about them at the end. But I hope, I hope we're clear on just cause because we have a few more points to go through that are equally as exciting, <laughs> if not more. And so you might be wondering when it comes to a just cause, okay, do I have to go out and establish my own just cause? Do, do I have to suddenly become a visionary? And at the end of the day, the majority of us are not visionaries. I'll say I'm not a visionary, but what's important is to find a vision that you can align yourselves with. And I believe you all have done that just by being in this room today. And for those that end up tuning in later, by being a part of this organization, you have found some way that you align with the vision of this company. And that's a beautiful thing. That's great. because It's going to take all of us. So let's move on to our second pillar here. Second pillar is building trusting teams, and I love this topic. So Simon actually wrote a book called Leaders Eat Last, which explores some of this more in depth, but trusting teams is so essential, especially as organizations trying to deal with a rapidly changing world. A team that is high on inspiration, but low on trust, I assure you, will not have a long lifespan. But a team that is even low on inspiration, but high on trust, can serve as its own source of inspiration because you probably have all experienced in your careers, a, a tight knit trusting team is relatively rare in this world, always has been. So the idea of building trusting teams is to create an environment in which people feel compelled to operate at their natural best. So we're gonna get into some details of this, but let's redefine some ideas right here. So first let's talk about teams. Our idea of a team is anytime you have two or more people pursuing a similar objective or goal. When you look at it that way, you realize we are constantly surrounded by teams. Uh, you and your life partner are a team. You and your manager might be a team. You and your pet might be a team. You and your neighbor could be a team. It's anytime you have two or more people pursuing the same objective, you are now in a team sort of scenario. And when I talk about leadership as well, leadership isn't something that's completely based on title. Leadership is simply someone who's able and willing to help the person to the left and to the right of them, and maybe someone who can use a hand up who's below them as well. So when it comes to leadership and team, I don't want you to think, oh, well, I'm not a team lead, so this doesn't apply to me. This applies to, to all of us here in this room. So there are four key things here when it comes to building trusting teams. In this diagram right here, I have to mention it. Like I said earlier, it is not a, a Simon concept if there isn't a circle involved, right? I did say that earlier, right? I warned you. <laughs> so you might have heard this term psychological safety um, come up. I see it on LinkedIn here and there. But Simon has this term called the circle of safety. And in looking back at our, our evolution, our social evolution, uh, Simon discovered that we are always looking for you know, metaphorical circles of safety with the people that we are around, all the way from the time where we were hunter-gatherers on the, uh, the plains of the savannah up until now with our organizations. We realized very early on that as animals on this planet, we were not the strongest, the fastest, we might not even be the smartest creatures on this planet, but we are capable, especially when we have some support. It's a lot easier to prepare for survival when you know that you have uh, something in common with someone who can cover your interests, cover your back, maybe as simply as while you were sleeping. Imagine being in a scenario where you're out in the wilderness by yourself and you can barely sleep because you're worried about lions, tigers, bears, or what else might be out there. Well, this trait has carried with us today. We are constantly looking and evaluating areas for safety. And this is even as, you know, regular casual people, not even as employees, we're constantly thinking, is this a place where I can bring my best? 
Is this a place where my contribution is valued? Is this a place where I feel seen and heard? And that's critical when it comes to getting people on board, especially with what might be new or challenging objectives or, or business missions. So the first idea here is just to understand the circle of safety. Inherently and historically, there's always been danger outside of our circles, outside of our teams, outside of our communities. Now in modern times, it doesn't look like lions and tigers and bears, but it could look like a global pandemic. It could look like a new entrant into our business world, a new competitor. It could look like changing government regulations. These are things that threaten the safety of what we have going on in our group. And we are constantly evaluating to see how we belong and how we can contribute. Ideally, as I mentioned, building trusting teams, we create, we facilitate an environment where everybody feels compelled. They feel drawn to give their best. Has anyone ever had a shower thought about solving a problem at work? You're in the shower, you're just cooking food or maybe mowing the lawn and you're like, oh, I solved this, I, this challenge that was, you know, kicking my butt all weekend and I have an idea for Monday. Has anybody had that experience once, twice, maybe? I, I suggest to you that you felt like you had some degree of safety within that team because no one's paying you to think about the job when you're not there, correct? No one's paying you. That's something voluntary to do. In some less fortunate cases, people are actively trying to avoid and forget whatever happened to them at work that week. So the fact that you even had the capacity to generate an idea and then bring it forward is huge. That tells me there's, that suggests that there's an idea of, of safety within that time period for you with work. That's a really big deal. And so by establishing this idea of building trusting teams, we get more of that. That's where some people get their best ideas. Letting something marinate, you know, being on their free time and Simon calls this discretionary energy and attention and then bringing that to the job. Well, that's where we get some of our best innovations, some of our most unique ideas is when people are able to, to cross their experiences with what's going on in the workplace. So why wouldn't we want to bolster and build more trust in our teams? So again, that starts with the idea of understanding a circle of safety, just a place where people feel compelled to bring their best. Second thing here with building trusting teams is showing vulnerability. Now, a lot of this, you know, can seem like it might be posited just for people who might have the title of leaders, but it's an opportunity for all of us to, to broaden the awareness in our environment. Now, I'm actually going to ask for some participation here. Real quick, can someone tell me a definition of the word vulnerability, their definition? No wrong answers here. I'm hearing all of it. Exposing a personal weakness. Love it. Thank you so much. Can I get another? Get another try? I'm doing math here. I'm doing science. Open and honest. Open and honest. Love it. We'll take those two. I don't want to put you on the spot. I know you're not here to work. It's it's that's on me. So great definitions. Here's the thing. We've had a big, I'd say, shift in our business culture here in the States where people talk about things like vulnerability. And that's great progress because there's a period of time, maybe not too long ago, 20, 30 years ago, where the idea of vulnerability showing weakness, showing that soft underbelly that you, you know, can be hurt, that you are fallible was a challenge. That's not how we identified strong leadership at all. We did not uphold that value. But often what happens is the idea of vulnerability that we have is around just sharing a weakness. And I'm here to offer that vulnerability could be sharing your full self, total self, your strengths, and your opportunities. And that's very, very important. Here's the thing, while talking about your weaknesses or having a team that's comfortable talking about their weaknesses is valuable, that's not the whole story. We are all much more than our weaknesses, our deficits, our opportunities for improvement. And in fact, for teams and team leads and management especially, people only talking about their vulnerabilities can eventually be kind of useless to you because now you don't know how to put that people, that person in an area of their strengths. So imagine you're in your circle of safety, you're in your team, you're maybe because this is a more intimate size organization, maybe we'll just say the whole org. But eventually over time, if you only feel like you can share your weaknesses within your organization, are you going to feel so compelled to show off your strengths? that one odd skill that you get good at over the weekend or picked up in college that could help someone solve a problem? No, you're not if the environment is only focused on weaknesses. So when it comes to showing vulnerability, the opportunity for us here is to learn how to get comfortable sharing 
our strengths as well as our weaknesses, bringing our full self into our circle of safety so that we can make a more dynamic environment that facilitates trust. And I'll give you just a quick litmus test right here. Raise your hand and maybe, you know what? Well, I feel like we have some trust here. Raise your hand if you can say that you have trouble accepting a compliment. I'll raise my hand. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a compliment. These are the strengths. These are the things that you're probably excelling at. And a lot of us struggle with just that. So if you wanted an opportunity to work on your vulnerability, accepting a compliment and knowing that you're confident in that is a way to work on that. And no one's ever mentioned the word weakness at all. So just a, a quick little thing you could run with this week. Give it a try. See if you can take a compliment. You'll be improving your ability to manage vulnerability in your environment. And thirdly, talk about using candor with care. Now, candor is simply the, the ability to have a difficult or uncomfortable conversation or discussion point. But this care part is essential. Care means that when something difficult has to come up, that I share it or it is shared in our, or the expectation is that it's shared in our environment with the hope that it helps somebody grow. You're thinking about that person's future. Now, I won't ask for anybody to raise any hands. I'll just use my experience, but I've definitely experienced uh, managers, people in authority, people in leadership give a lot of candor with no care whatsoever. In fact, that used to kind of be how we saw strong leadership here in the States. It was someone who was a straight shooter, who told the truth, who stuck to their guns, who gave it to them like it is. But when you don't care for the person, it actually suggests that, wait a second, I might not be safe here. Because if for me to get feedback or if there's a problem, which is naturally going to happen, we, we make mistakes, things happen. If the risk of, of being corrected or being you know, coached through that scenario means that no one's thinking about me as a person, well, then I might not feel as safe to mention that I have a problem or that I've made a mistake or that I see there's a challenge over there coming and we could avoid it if we have, you know, if we consider things differently. So candor with care is extremely important. My suggestion on that way is to merely open up the channels of feedback. Now, when I say the word feedback, does anyone have like a slightly guttural response like, ooh, feedback, I don't, I don't really like how that feels? Just me? Just me getting over this? Okay, no worries. <laughs> feedback all too often is only a one-way street where we only discuss things that are not working well. That's generally how feedback is used. But there's an opportunity for feedback to be, again, a two-way street. So if you can find an opportunity to praise somebody in your team, in your organization for something great they did, or acknowledge somebody, or have a conversation just to say, hey, how are you feeling today? Not, how is your weekend? Tell me, you know, the casual, but like really lean in and say, this is an interaction of engagement, of feedback, where we want to talk about something positive. That is one way we've seen to be really effective to help open the, this opportunity for candor with care. And that way, when the more difficult discussions need to be had, we have a sense of trust already built in. Because the thing about trust when it comes to, to teamwork and even ourselves is trust is built in moments of peace, not in moments of tension. It's kind of like a bank account. So if you think of it that way, it's like, how much can I stack up my chips? How much can I stack up my money, my trust chips when things are calm? How much can I build these dynamic relationships so that we have something to, to draw from when things get tight? And maybe we don't have as much space or time to, to be as thoughtful as we'd like to be. Last but not least, living the culture is, is the last way that we build trusting teams. Our values, those things that we have kind of summed up in our just cause these aren't just things to be put on our website or put on our office walls or in our email signatures. These are actually qualities that we need to embody. And so the more that we can not only stay aligned with our values, and we just had a moment of going over our values today, which was super useful, the more we can actually live our values, the more that we create this feeling of trust because the expectation, what's being put out there publicly that we stand for is what we experience as individuals within our teams. And that matters a lot. That consistency is massive. Again, I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise hands, but I've definitely been uh, close enough to organizations that did the complete opposite of what they said they believed in. And my trust had never been lower. <laughs> so this is, this is a very a tangible thing. And again, this isn't just 
on leaders to do. Yes, leaders get a lot of visibility here, but we have the opportunity to have an influence in our environment just by picking up some of these principles. And I assure you, if you take these things to task, those around you will suddenly, magically start to feel like they want to share more things with you. They want to open up. They'll come with you to a new idea or a new frustration. And this shows that we're building trust within our team. Everyone cool so far on board? I'm from the East Coast, so sometimes it, it kicks in and I just start speaking fast. So let me know. We're doing okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's get to our third pillar here. Because this is where sometimes people get a little tense, studying worthy rivals. So if I mention this whole thing is about game theory and we're in business and you could say, OK, yeah, business is an infinite game. But the competition, though, this is the part to really to really hone in on. So in the infinite game, because there are no set players, there, there's no set scoreboard, nothing like that. The opportunity goes less from focusing and being laser focused on our competition as a threat in seeing others who play the game of business as an opportunity to improve ourselves. The idea of studying worthy rivals takes the comparison away from us versus them, and it becomes us versus us yesterday. And so let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the differences to make it clear. So when it comes to competition, it, it forces us, as you can see, to take on an attitude of winning. We've already mentioned in Infinite Game, there's no winning. You cannot win business. You cannot win marriage. You're not going to win health. You're going to do the best you can until you don't have any more time left. So competition doesn't completely apply here when we're talking about adopting and adapting to an infinite mindset. Oftentimes, competition focuses, uh, encourages us to focus on outputs. What can we show? What can we prove? How can we get this markup, this metric up? But in doing so, and we can, especially in this country, think of a lot of cases where uh, I mentioned that lack of cooperation and, and loss of trust, this win at cost mentality encourages people due to competition to start cutting corners, to start stepping over red tape, to maybe engage in some felonious or illegal activity. It's all because of this mindset of competition, this finite ideal in this infinite game of business. Whereas we can look at things from a worthy rival perspective, and that encourages us to take on an attitude of improvement. Because you know what? At the end of the day, even those that are number one in their field, they aren't number one necessarily every day. You can still be dominating your area of, of specialty and not have to be the best every single time. And you can think of a lot of teams, take, take sports teams, take, take business leaders who've had ups and downs in their career. And the only way that you can even maintain the will to keep going is to look at it as a, as a personal thing, as a journey, rather than a fixed destination that you must get to at all costs. It also encourages us to look at our processes, as well as keep us focused on doing everything in our power to move those values encapsulated in our just cause forward. And that's another way that all this stuff kind of sinks to it. We're focused on our just cause. And by focusing on our just cause, our desire to serve, our desire to realize this very clear vision of the future kind of helps us step away from our ego of I'm doing better with no score than this person who I think is kind of doing not so great again with no score. So the fun thing I love about studying worthy rivals, and this even applies on a personal level, I call this modeling, is that you can find worthy rivals everywhere. And here's a really good way to find a worthy rival. I even suggest look for somebody outside of your industry. But if there's a, a company name, again, I will not be here with y'all for the remainder of this day or this week. There's probably a couple, a couple company names or organization names that get floated around amongst you that kind of make you say, ugh, I don't like what they're doing. There's an opportunity to find your worthy rival because chances are they are excelling somewhere that you are aware that you have a, a weakness or, or an opportunity in, but you can find worthy rivals anywhere. So you're an organization. Well, you don't have to take the full organization on that task. You can look at marketing. You can say, hey, we're great. We are a, an amazing sales team, but you know what? We could do a little bit better when it comes to our marketing. Who's someone out there that's crushing it on social media? What can we learn from them to improve what we have going on? So when you look at it that way, when you use your, what would classically be called your, your competition as now your worthy rivals, you get the opportunity to improve you never lose. In fact, it continues 
to encourage you to do this self-discovery, the self-assessment of actually, you know what, I, I demand to know where we might not be uh, leading class so that we can get there. Because I believe in our team, I believe in our just cause and our ability to make progress if we focus on ourselves. Does that resonate with everybody? A little bit here or there? Okay, cool. So I love this slide because you can get creative with your worthy rivals. Some of your worthy rivals in your personal life might not even be real people. There are characters and books that I aspire to be more like. Um, when it comes to, to business, you don't have to stay in your industry. In fact, a lot of the biggest innovations that are made in business come from people who are familiar with two completely different industries, but then are able to arbitrage an opportunity or a small bit of knowledge that then it catapults their business to a new strata. There's so much fun and creative activity that can go on when you seriously take yourself to task with studying your worthy rivals. And again, this all allows you to maintain time in the game that you're playing. Worthy rivals is a fun one. So fourth, and then we will be at our fifth point right here, is preparing for existential flexibility. Now, what's different about this pillar compared to the other ones is they all have very strong action verb, advance a just cause, uh, study worthy rivals, um, build trusting teams. But this one's a little bit more passive, preparing for existential flexibility. And what we mean by that is merely having the capacity to create a completely different way of going about business, to completely disrupt, to maybe even destroy a former business model in order to more effectively pursue your just cause. I'll take my company as an example here. It must have been February of 2020 when we noticed that our engagement starting in the East, so China moving towards the US across Asia and Europe, were starting to get shut down. 80% of our entire business was in-person events. There wasn't even an opportunity for me to, to telecommute here. That's just not what we did. We were always on planes. We were always meeting in person. We loved that. That's what we've been doing for a decade. But then the pandemic hit. And then the war reserves ran out. And Simon literally had a meeting. He said, I need everybody to show up to our next meeting with 15 opportunities, 15 ideas on how we can pivot, how we could engage this existential flex of this global pandemic so that we can still stay in business. You want to know what one of the small ideas was like idea number 13 on somebody's list was? What if we did live classes on Zoom? At the time, mind you, this is like March, <laughs> April of 2020, everybody wasn't on board yet. But as we see almost two years later, not only have we been able to make that adjustment successfully, turn that corner and make that pivot, but now we're actually able to have a larger impact and spread these ideas of our help industry, help others industry more than ever. Because now I'm not constrained by, by travel times, human fatigue, logistics, and things like that. In fact, our material is so much more accessible. So that's a great example of an existential flex or X flex as we call it. Now, interestingly enough, Simon released this book in December of 2019, right before the pandemic hit. And he had suggested that as an individual in your career or a business might have one to two X flexes in their entire lifespans in their career. And then the entire world basically had an opportunity to engage in one. So it was, it was interesting to see that point played out at scale. And, and we've been really interested in how people have made some of these changes. But in order to successfully drastically change how you're doing business, there's a couple things we need to, to lock down on. First and foremost, we need clarity on our just cause. Our just cause, again, is our North Star. And this helps us avoid something that you all might be familiar with. It's called shiny object syndrome. Does anybody else have a, a struggling addiction with that? There's a new product on, on TechCrunch or something. And I'm like, oh, I need to have that. Oh, I need to have that. Oh, this looks like a new tool. This is a, this is a kind of a problem sometimes uh, within certain organizations or even as individuals. But by focusing on our just cause, we anchor the activity that we are pursuing. Because remember, this is going to be something disruptive. You know, especially for, for organizations that, that have some momentum going, it can be very difficult to redirect that ship when you realize there might be another opportunity or direction to go in. So our just cause is really important to anchor our decision making 
Because again, we're only doing this giant disruption to better accomplish our just cause given the circumstances in front of us today. Secondly, we need trusting teams. I mentioned earlier that if we could do it all ourselves, we wouldn't need to even have this discussion, but we can't. We're going to need diverse perspectives and skill sets and, and knowledge sets. But this is where trust comes in even more because everybody is already working hard for the direction that we had set course in. But when we are going to completely change direction or let's say take a whole 180, we're going to need all hands on deck more than ever before. And this is going to be the moment where people have the most number of questions, the most amount of uncertainty. And without that level of trust built, again, in those times of peace, in those times of calm, when the intensity and the pressure rises, people might find themselves lacking engagement. You might not find all hands on deck where you expected them to be. So trusting teams are essential when you're going to redirect the course of the ship to better pursue your just cause. And then last but not least, we want to have a forward focus rather than reactive. This is helped out again by following our North Star, but things change in our world all the time. So as individuals, as, as leaders, as people capable of leadership as well, we have the, the almost obligation to critically examine the opportunities in front of us. Am I doing this just because I saw a competitor do it? Am I doing this because someone told me it's the next big thing? Or am I doing this because it's actually going to pave a solid way forward to accomplishing this just cause that's, that's based in service? So XFlex. Uh, and all of these principles can apply to personal lives as well. So when Brandon mentioned that I'm an adventurer, my personal XFlexes are, are many and often um, but as, as well as my career, I've made many drastic pivots in my career. Would you believe it? I started the pandemic holding a whole garden company, and now I, uh, I get to talk <laughs> about existential flexibility in front of amazing people. It's a wild life if you, uh, if you embrace it with an infinite mindset. <laughs> Last but not least, and then we'll go to, to Q&A, is demonstrating the, the courage to lead. And you're well those those tuning in i, I want to make sure everybody is familiar with with cvs has everybody heard of cvs pharmacy store here in the states competitor with walgreens all that sort of stuff 2014 cvs uh it came to the attention of someone on the board of directors that it was kind of a conflict of interest for them to sell tobacco products in their stores cvs said that their mission their just cause we can we can use that term was to protect the health of the communities in which they serve. Yet they were making over $2 billion a year selling tobacco products. That's 2 billion with a B, a billion. That's a lot of money. So one of these directors clearly demonstrated the courage to lead. He said, okay, we need to pull all this stuff from our shelves. And with consensus, they rolled out that plan. Does anybody remember this happening? Okay, I see a couple heads nodding. Yeah, this really happened. As soon as they announced it, the news was terrible. Their, I think Jim Cramer was yelling about them. Not, not, a, not a slight on Jim Cramer. He tends to yell. That's his preferred style of communication. Jim Cramer was yelling about them. Their, their stock price went down. People said they would never recover. And they took a hit for about six months. Their price stock dipped as they began removing tobacco products from their shelves. But they were anchored in their just cause and what they thought was right. They didn't know what would happen. And CVS is a big company. $2 billion is a lot of money. But something really, really interesting happened towards that dip of their stock prices. Companies who were familiar with CVS, but didn't like their values simply because they sold tobacco products and they, that didn't align with their organization values, started reaching out to CVS and said, hey, we saw what you did. We've been wanting to do business with you for a while. Is there an opportunity to form a partnership here? Brands that were formerly not interested at all in CVS started doing business with them. Communities started benefiting from CVS as well. In areas where CVS took tobacco out, I believe it's the state of California, all smoking rates dropped by something like one to 2% in those areas where CVS was a dominant player in the market. So this is something interesting when you think about competition. One of our fears with competition is, well, if we don't do it, if we don't get the business, somebody else will. In those areas, nobody else continued to sell more cigarettes than CVS. All the smoking in those areas went down. 
they markedly improved the health of the communities in which they served. They lived their values, but they could only do this by having the courage to lead. And a couple things here with courage that, that I want to that I want to share with you. Uh, you know, one, the CVS is a great example, but we have opportunities all the time to demonstrate courage within our own lives, within our teams. It could be the courage to take a compliment for you one day, and then it's the courage to have your teammates back another week. But here's one thing about courage that we often get wrong. Oftentimes, we think that courage is a universal quality. Let me explain what I mean by that. We see somebody do something courageous, and we just say, oh, they're a courageous person. They're courageous in everything. But that's not how courage works, and it's important that we understand that. We each might have different areas and strength for courage. I myself, I like to jump out of functional airplanes with a parachute. That's a thing I'm into. If you have a pet spider, do not come near me with your pet tarantula. That's not where I have my courage at. <laughs> so courage is more of a localized experience. And by understanding that, not only can we leverage better everything, all the strengths that we bring to the table, but we can better understand what it takes to make some of these decisions. Courage is not a global attribute. But here's some things we need to consider as businesses who need to be courageous, especially in these times where, where values, where reputations, a lot more things are out in the open and public than they were ever before. So how can we lean better into that? What are the responsibilities of business when it comes to, to courage and leadership in general? And again, this applies to all of us. First and foremost, advancing a purpose. There is more to your organization than the ability to bring in money, to, to generate dollars. There's more to you as an employee than the ability to bring in dollars for your household. It's important, but we have to understand a value. We have to see a contribution beyond just those transactional activities. Businesses, especially businesses of this size, are literally the lifeblood of this country. This is where new employment opportunities come from. This is where innovation comes from. There is so much more that can be played out if we can attach ourselves to, to a purpose, to that just cause, to see beyond just the ability to generate income. Secondly, responsibility of business is to protect their people. We talked about some ways that we can do this, especially when it comes to building trusting teams. But we need to take care of our people, the people that buy from us, as well as the people in the areas, the communities, environments in which we operate. This is essential because it's going to take all of us. And we also suffer the impacts. We can clearly see where we suffer the impacts of companies who never thought about the environment. <laughs> it's why we have such a strong need for uh, you know, eco-reform and eco-justice. And then last but not least, companies do have the responsibility of generating profit. So I said we get called optimists sometimes, and that is correct, but we are not delusional. I'm a rational optimist. Uh, cash is the fuel of a business. And so especially if you have a strong just cause, if you see yourself serving something greater than just the ability to bring in money, then yes, you need to bring that money so you can keep serving. It's the fuel that allows you to serve. It's the fuel that allows you to continue expanding and pushing our world into a more positive and hopefully kinder place as well. So that being said, uh, I, I hope that the, the difference between infinite and finite games are, are clear for you all. I hope that you have fun trying to identify different areas or maybe, you know, an area where you're like, oh, yeah, I'm approaching this a little bit more finite minded. And this isn't actually an infinite game. Have fun with it. I do it all the time. Most importantly, it's, it's important to understand that we can't choose the game. We can't choose the rules but we can choose how we play. And I firmly believe that an organization that is well-positioned like this one has a tremendous opportunity simply by adapting a more infinite mindset because I'd love to continue seeing you thrive in the future. That would be thrilling for me. So with that all being said, I appreciate your patience, your attention, um, and, and thank you for this, this first opening hour of, of time right here. Thank you, y'all. Out of the uh, five pillars that you mentioned, is there one that you think is more important than the others? Mm, no. <laughs> so, so it's, again, it, it really helps to think about health. You know, I can go to the gym all I want, but if my diet is not right, if my sleep patterns aren't right, uh, if I'm not fueling my body with nutrients, it all won't work. So it's really a synergistic effect. 
Uh, we do mention a just cause a lot, but here's the thing. If you don't, um, if a person doesn't have the courage to sit and clearly articulate the vision, the yet unrealized vision of the future that they want to achieve, right? Pillar number five, if they don't have that courage, that just cause is going to be difficult to get done. <laughs> so it's kind of like a synchronicity, but um, I, we always encourage people to start where they are. Chances are an, an organization has some form of a vision statement. Chances are an organization has a team. Well, we have all these different levels where we can start building in these areas so that you can ultimately realize a greater infinite mindset, just like with health. I'm a, I'm a former track and field athlete. If someone wants to get in shape, I'm not going to go tell them to run a marathon. I'm going to tell them to walk for 15 minutes today and keep at it. Does that help? Um, great. From your most recent presentations to other companies, uh, in the spirit of um, uh, worthy rivals, uh, what is the um, what is the thing that most companies miss out of all that? <sighs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a really good question. So some of it is 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 just habit. We are in the habit of. And this is a cultural thing here in the States. We love looking at things as prescriptions. I have an issue. I need, I need a pill. I need a specific fix for this thing. We struggle looking at things holistically. So that's one thing. It's kind of like um, the expectation. Well, I did all these five things and I didn't get the results as quickly as I wanted to. So it must not work. That's, that's one of the challenges people have. But the other thing is, is finding the space to uh, adjust expectations so that things can be allowed to be a little bit more infinite. In some organizations, especially when it comes to a sales function, your quarterly numbers are your quarterly numbers. Now we can point to a ton of very public examples where people did some pretty not cool things for the sake of quarterly numbers. So how can we adjust our systems so that, or our, our reporting so that we can be a little bit more infinite, infinite minded. And Simon's suggestion for this is to look more at trends rather than individual points. If we're trending in the direction we want to go, if we're directionally correct, that's very useful. A lot of people's KPIs aren't set up for that. So that is, that is an adjustment because again, that ties to compensation, uh, you know, perceived job performance and things like that. So it's finding ways to, to adapt these into uh, more concrete metrics. Great question. <laughs> Study worthy rivals, yes. But there's some companies that do this very, very well. The challenge is a lot of those companies tend to be uh, privately held, uh, not listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So some of them you, you really have to seek out. And then you understand why their company is so brilliant and self-contained. It's because they're good. They don't feel a need or pressure to scale to the moon. Hope that's sir. So when it comes to an infinite game model, when you look at something like pop culture or content, the fact that people keep putting stuff out there, how can you still be able to make a machine or just creating more things, the thing the first new things, but still be able to measure it on an infinite timeline? Could you ask that same question a different way? I think I caught the first half. <laughs> okay. Uh when it comes to content, you keep putting stuff out into the void on an infinite timeline because sometimes it's very hard to have like the stats like, oh, this posted well, this posted well, or oh, people remember us with this one campaign we did five years ago, like the Geico Caving yeah. commercials or the Geico Gecko. So how do we measure yeah. on a longer term the impact the content that we created has had? Absolutely, really good question. And it just so happens I, I in a former life was an awarded content creator. So I think the opportunity is, is kind of twofold there. One is being clear again on your just cause. What is the actual, and sometimes you can think about it this way. If I were, when I close my laptop or leave my office at the end of the day, did I contribute to our clearly defined just cause? Because chances are your just cause doesn't involve your, your organic reach on TikTok. It's a component that might play into your just cause to support the business, but it's not everything that matters. Um, so looking at the, the values that you say you wanna to work towards, that world you wanna create, and then also realigning expectations. I've seen personally where businesses miss the mark all the time because they're looking for, they're looking for scale, they're looking for reach, 
But the important thing, especially when they say we're a company that cares about our people, the most important metric is engagement. Taking that a step farther, people are engaging with your content and you're not engaging back with them. So do we need more reach or do we need to double down on the things that we say we're about and actually make that impact? That's one way of looking at it. Um, and Ben, to, to be fair, a lot of the traditional ad buying practices come from very much industrialized TV days. Some of those things, you know, when it comes to ad buys, how much reach we want, uh, it's a huge discussion and people are still you know, storming and, and forming their norms on how does this translate into a social media world? And a lot of people with the biggest budgets tend to have the old school ad budgets and they're like, this isn't performing the way I thought it was. Well, you're talking about a different medium. So I think adjusting expectations and also giving yourself the time to establish what is optimal for your organization, because it might not be the same as the organization next to you, depending on what you're driving towards, that world you want to see. Hope that was thorough. Y'all want to hear a really funny cynic story real quick that talks about the infinite game? Yes, no, you might be tired of stories. About, okay, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Simon being the, the popular fella he is, was invited to speak at education summits for both Microsoft and Apple. He went to the Microsoft event first. He said there, 80% of the speakers spent about 80% of their time talking about how they were going to beat Apple, how they were going to outperform them. Mm -hmm. At the Apple event, he said 100% of the speakers spoke 100% of the time about how they were going to empower teachers to use their tools and how they were going to reach students. Case in point. First, now, after the Microsoft event, he was given a gift of a Microsoft Zoom. Did anybody used to own one of those? I did. I definitely had a Zoom. Mm -hmm. This was an early uh, MP3 player when the MP3 wars were out. Uh, the iPod existed, but the Zoom was this new great thing. It had a beautiful multicolored touchscreen. Um, it had all these function, uh, functions and, and features. It was, it was great. And so Simon likes to stir the pot a little bit. And remember, he went to the Apple event very shortly after. He didn't get a gift from Apple. What he got was the opportunity to, to ride in a, in a cab. That's how long ago it was. Uh, with one, I think it was employee 54 at Apple. So somebody who was very high up, senior, had a lot of experience. And Simon just wanted to see what would happen, as is the nature. He said, uh, hey, so last week I was talking at the Microsoft Education Summit. Great event. They gave me a gift. It was a Microsoft Zoom. I have to say, it's a fantastic device. It's, it's better than an iPod. <laughs> the director, without missing a beat, turned to Simon and said, I have no doubts. And that was it. That was the whole discussion. Two years later, Apple released the, and forgive me, my dates are off, but two years later, Apple released the iPhone, which completely capitulated the entire iPod or, you know, MP3 player market. And that's a great example of, of just where focus is at. From the speaker's all the way to those higher up in the leadership, they were looking at a longer term image. It wasn't about who was winning in this moment because actually Apple just hit over 50% market share when it comes to, to cell phone usage. That used to not be the case, that's massive, but it takes that sort of long reaching vision to, to even give yourself the space and opportunity to reach that. So I love sharing that story and it was, it was right on point with what you mentioned. So, so thank you for your patience and listening. <laughs> Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? I kind of have one. Uh, so you talked in Xbox about uh, building the capacity to initiate an extreme disruption. That's mm -hmm. like a terrifying concept to yeah. me. Um, how do you uh, work around that fear? What um, suggestions do you have to be successful at that? Well, remember one of the one of the things we need with um, <laughs> with XFlex to be successful is we need those trusting teams. And I found in either personal or organizational situations where I've had the most fear, it's only been when I didn't feel like the person, the people closest to me, were were capable. <laughs> It's kind of like when you get a group project in school, you might remember, and there's always, you're like, am I going to be the person that does all the work or, or are we all going to pitch in here? 
is sort of some of that energy, which is, which is why all these principles come to play. Um, but I think some of that fear can be replaced by, by courage because it takes, it, it's scary to do courageous things. It's scary to even put out your just cause in public because guess what? Now people can see it. There's some level of, of accountability. There's some social pressures there. So fear is always inherent. It's just how can I use my resources, whether that's my team or maybe some of my reflection with my, uh, you know, with my worthy rivals. Someone else has done something scary. It's the only reason we're here right now. It's because all this stuff was terrifying. <laughs> so it's, it's finding your window of comfort. And more importantly, it's finding your base of support. Hopefully that comes from your team. So you're all facing this together. Because I will take on a very daunting, scary task if I feel like I'm not alone. But as soon as I feel like it's just me that's going to catch all the fallout, then yeah, sometimes those walls of fear can be too high to scale. And there's a really good book. It's an old book, but I'm kind of an old soul. It's called Feel the, Fa feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And I mentioned I casually that I jump out of planes. I do. And it is scary every single time. <laughs> Sometimes there's an opportunity, and this is, even goes into the idea, depending on how you deploy projects within your organization, of pilots. Is there a way that we can test this out or get a, a sense, a reasonable sense of outcome while not putting everything at stake? So our whole company, while we transitioned into this online format very, very quickly and engaged very deeply, we did some tests. <laughs> we tried it out first. Um, this is where tests and pilots can be very useful because we're lowering what's at stake, which allows us to, to learn with more complete awareness and then hopefully apply for that larger transition that we are hoping to be successful through. Oh, I had a question. Um, so when it comes to adopting a new mindset in the way that you approach business, I'm sure that's also affected the way that you approach life. And so I was curious, um, how that's affected your life since adopting this mindset? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, let's go on an adventure. I'll put it to you this way. My experience has been the opposite. So when I was interviewing for this job and I actually had an interview with Simon, which was kind of terrifying. Um, he's just such a warm and, and friendly guy and you can feel it through the camera. And, and I'm, a, I'm a pretty good speaker. I, I'm comfortable with folks. I'm just like, oh, it's the guy. Um, one of the things I mentioned to him, I said, I get the infinite game because I live the infinite game. Um, and so I kind of have a personal lens on this business content and then I can see the connections backwards. But for me, this is very much my life. I took, I quit my job, took a one-way ticket, lived in Paris for two years at 24. I used to be a D1 all-conference athlete. I'm a professional musician. I travel all around the world. Like this is my fifth career. It's perpetual X flex right here. So in some way I've found, I've kind of like looked through the process backwards and said, oh yeah, I did kind of have a just cause or my trusting team was my support network or my worthy rivals is that idea of modeling. Um, so I've kind of found my way into this, into understanding it through a very personal way. And now the adventure just continues. This is just how I live my life. And it also ties in with my why, if you're familiar with that work. Uh, my why is to embrace chaos so that we can reveal and celebrate our authentic selves. So there's, there's a little connection there. <laughs> Great questions. Well, I don't want to keep you, I wanna honor your time. Um, if, if there's one more question, thought or comment, they've been great so far. Uh, if, if not, uh, if, if we have permission to close, we can do that as well. We really appreciate you, Jerry. Um, everyone, you guys agree? Thank you. Thank you so much, y'all. I, I hope this serves. I, I hope it gives you some perspective and, and allows you, empowers you to, to continue blazing trails as you have been. So thank you so much on behalf of myself and the rest of the team. And uh, hope we keep the conversation going. Reach out to us anytime. Thank you.